We're uh, here at the Pavic Museum in, uh, of uh, Broadcasting in the, uh, with the Association of the Minnesota Broadcasters Association, talking to pioneers in broadcasting and getting some of the stories that uh, grew up around broadcasting in the early days. In the beginning, it was shortwave, and then it was radio, and then it became television. But in every case, there's been a group of pioneers who made wh what followed. Uh, your father was certainly one of those men, uh, Stanley S. Yep. And you're Stanley E. No, he's it's Stanley the other E, way. and I'm Stanley S. That's it. And my son is Stanley E. the second. Oh, is that right? One of my sons. Uh huh. And uh, he, uh, if we can dwell on him for a bit, uh, he he was one of those pioneers in news as well, broadcast news, because he seemed to be more a newsman than he was a broadcaster, or at least he had a news sense that was unique among the owners or managers of broadcast properties. Do uh, you recall any incidents that uh, highlight that particular phase of your father's work? Well, I recall many incidents, Jim, and I'm delighted to be with you. I uh, want to make something clear, though. He, I think that it is true that he was a newsman, but he was also a showman. Oh, indeed. He loved show business, and he had the Sunset Valley Barn Dance and numerous other things, yes. I, and I can tell you some things that are, uh, if you want, that have to do with news and things that don't have to do with news. But he was, he was always interested in news, and he, he became interested in news because back in the 1920s, he used to, uh, he, he was a member of the United States Secret Service. And he was a pilot, and they called him Captain Hubbard. And he flew out of Florida tracking down uh, uh, people who were trying to uh, bring rum, you know, and whiskey into the United mm -hmm. States. And he got tied up with federal agents, and he became interested in the news. And <clears throat> at a later date, uh, he helped the, the Milwaukee Police Department put the first uh, radios, the first police radios in their cars uh, that were ever put in a police car in the United States. And during that time, he was allowing uh, a KSTP radio to be used as a police radio. I don't know if you knew that, Jim. No. But in the early days of uh, radio, both, uh, I shouldn't say both, because I'm not sure that WAMD, which was began in 1923 and which was a predecessor to KSTP, I'm not sure whether they did it, but I know that KSTP did the following. When the police had a call, uh, they would interrupt the program and they would announce that a police car should go to such and such a location because there was something happening in the police uh, uh, needed to get the information quickly. So he made an arrangement whereby he allowed the police to use the KSTP radio station. So if a woman were sitting at home listening to the radio, all of a sudden her radio would be interrupted with a police call. I see. And that was way, way back, as you can imagine, in the very early days of radio. So he became very involved with the police and with the use of radio to help the police and with the technology that went on. In fact, uh, if you talk to the police department in St. Paul, the chief can tell you about how uh, uh, he, when he was a sergeant on the St. Paul Police Department, uh, uh, he had to come out and work with my dear dad as to what kind of a police radio system to put into the St. Paul Police Department when they went into the, uh, their first Motorola system, I believe it was. And he also lined up the St. Paul Police Department with their first VHS system, which was a link radio system. He put that together. So now what I'm leading up to is he had this great interest in police work and to him, at that time, starting uh, uh, television and also being in the radio news back in the early days, the spot news, the uh, police blot, or what was happening was always of great importance to him. Mm -hmm. And the fact that radio could react instantaneously to something that was timely and, and that only radio could react to, mm -hmm. and you, Jim Borman, know that far better than I do with your great, magnificent career. So what I'm saying is this, that uh, uh, he realized the importance of news for analysis, for covering political events, for covering what happens at City Hall. But he also realized that radio was the one institution that could act, act instantaneously on a news event. Immediately. <laughs> and if you look at the, uh, we have many pictures. If you look down in our, as you walk in the back hall, the picture is going way back with the hard rubber tired truck to the KSDP remote units. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the way back in the early days, there was a terrific flood in the Mississippi River back in the uh, late 20s. And I know that KSTP sent uh, crews down to Cairo, Illinois, and did live shortwave radio broadcasts of that flood, both back to KSTP and to the National Broadcasting Company and to the country. That was, back, imagine that, back in the 1920s, doing live remote broadcast. 
Uh, I, I was imagining what it would be like to ride in a hard to wheel or hard well, uh, tired truck all the way down them. to Cairo. <laughs> well, I think it, they were beyond the hard tri tired truck when oh, you went to right? Cairo. But uh, we have pictures of those at the museum once, and they're very interesting because he was always interested in remote product, bringing news live to the people if possible. Right. And that was the, as I say, the one thing mm -hmm. radio could do. As you know, radio as immediacy mm -hmm. was a very great thing. So he did that. Uh, the last big uh, installation he made, which is kind of interesting, for a live remote broadcast was on a boat. We had a high-speed boat in Miami, Florida, which was rigged up with a very powerful shortwave transmitter. And he knew about the upcoming Bay of Pigs invasion. And that boat was all equipped so that it could, on very short notice, at speeds of about 30 to 35 knots, run to Cuba and make live broadcasts back uh, after the invasion of the uh, Bay of Pigs. Well, of course, the Bay of Pigs invasion uh, was a great disaster, and needless to say, the boat never did get used for mm -hmm. that purpose. So that was the last uh, uh, really big uh, finding that I can recall for radio news, because then, of course, television was coming along. Mm -hmm. But the radio news uh, was a very big thing. And he was also very, very uh, much involved in special events, covering... Uh, uh, events that could be planned. Oh, my dad did the very first broadcast in the world, live broadcast, play-by-play -play of a hockey game. Of a radio hockey, and he mm -hmm. did the play mm -hmm. himself. He used to do play-by-play -play in the early days of radio of Minnesota football. And uh, I, I suppose the VCCO was doing the same thing at that time, but uh, what he did was he had the wire services. And when the wire, and he watched the wire come in, the newspaper wire, and they, the play, you know, what was happening, mm -hmm. so-and-so got a touchdown, and he and whoever was with him in the booth would would fabricate this football game, and they, they'd be doing the broadcast of the football game back in 1924 or whatever it was, or 25, and they'd actually just be looking at the wire and then reconstructing reconstructing it as mm -hmm. they went along to <laughs> make it you know, an exciting broadcast of the, I, of the I, football game. I've heard uh, stories of his covering um, the arrival of uh, Marshal Bedolio, I think his name was, uh, oh. from... Uh, he flew a whole squadron of well, Italian uh, planes. You're talking about the World's Fair. Yes, at the World's 19, Fair. Was it 1939? It must have been, Or yes. whatever it was mm -hmm. when, uh, when, uh, when you said Bedolio, you threw my name off, and I could have thought of it. And he, uh, the person that, uh, oh, I can't think of his name. There were the, the Italian Air Force uh, flew across the Atlantic to the World's Fair. And my dad, to Chicago. Been, to Chicago's World Fair, having been involved in aviation for the many years, it worked as a person to establish you know, the uh, public relations and the promotion for this, for this thing. And he arranged for this, uh, uh, for the promotion and for the broadcasting of this event. You're right. He, and he mm -hmm. was awarded a, made a knight or whatever that is, or a cavalier of the Italian government. And that was. Is that right? Uh, what was the king's name? Uh, I've, I've, I've got all that. I could have rattled the name off the top of my head, but I can't. And if you want, I'll find it for you. No, it's not that, that important. But yes, he was involved in that. And he also was involved in, um, in Lindbergh's return to Minnesota, to Little Falls. Yes, he was. He was a mm -hmm. good friend of Lindbergh's. And uh, Lindbergh uh, uh, was a pilot, of course, at the same time that my dear dad was a pilot, before mm -hmm. he was involved in the radio. Mm -hmm. And he, used to, he told a story one time about a, a guy who wanted to ride with Lindbergh, and my dad didn't think Lindbergh was a very good pilot. He was a brave pilot who did many things, but he didn't think he was a great pilot in terms of his skill. Safety. Yeah, so he recommended this guy, don't take a ride with Lindbergh, he's crazy, he's liable to get you killed. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic, and so the guy never forgave him <laughs> for that. But he was, a, he was a fairly good friend of Lindbergh's, uh -huh. not a close friend. And they uh, uh, would talk from time to time. But then Lindbergh, in his later years, became rather reclusive, and it was very hard to reach him. Mm -hmm. So he didn't talk to Lindbergh much in the last 10 or 15 mm -hmm. years of Lindbergh's life. Well, this brings us out of the radio era and into the television era. Uh, and that's your era. You, you took over pretty much uh, for television. Although, uh, wasn't your station the first to get into television in the Twin Cities? Well, KSTP was the first station to be in television in the Twin Cities. It was one of the very first in the United States. Uh, my dear dad did his first television closed circuit broadcast in 1938. Uh, he was such a believer in television that he bought the first camera that RCA ever sold. He said right. And he, has, and he it talked the American Legion into putting a parade on in the summer of 1938, and they had, I think, half a dozen television sets in the old Radisson Hotel in the ballroom. 
you know, demonstrating what television was, and then they had the parade go by, and they televised the parade. And Rock Ulmer, who you might remember, was yes. a radio announcer, mm -hmm. did the play-by-play, -play or the, uh, uh -huh. the color of the parade. And that was the first television broadcast that mm -hmm. we know of in the Midwest. Uh -huh. Well, then, of course, uh, KSTP went on the air, and it was on the air about a year and a half, uh, almost two years before the next station, I do believe. But the thing I think that my dad was most proud of was that he, he started the, the first daily television newscast in the United States was on KSTP TV. I didn't the know The first that. regularly scheduled daily newscast was on uh, this television station. And he, he always had a vision and a dream of how... Uh, television, how important television could be to, the, to bringing news to the public, not only mm -hmm. things that had happened, but things that were happening. And I remember that we all, my dad and I had such great high regard for Joe Flaherty of CBS, who was really the father of uh, electronic news gathering on television. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we've been involved in television news. And now, of course, television news, all the stations are pretty much capable everywhere of doing what every other station does. So the, the name of the game in television news uh, in, in 1988 isn't so much as it used to be of, you know, who can come up with something new. It's more now of doing a better job, better writing, better, you know, mm -hmm. uh, announcers. That improving sort of the skill. Improving the skills of the people that are there, mm -hmm. yes. Well, the, the, this, uh, you've certainly made great use of it, exploited it uh, to a, its limit. And it's been uh, the means, really, for KSTP's growth over these years. And you've been responsible for that since you well, took over. When did you take over? I've only been partly responsible. My dad, I, I, I worked with him and I was involved since 19, uh, well, I was, I was here full-time since 1951. I was full-time while I was finishing school for three years. And I became the uh, president of the company in 1967, but prior to that I was involved for from about 1956 until that time and everything had happened. And my mm -hmm. dad and I were great friends and great partners. I'm very lucky you know, to have had the dad I had because I love this business. This business is fun. Right. And right. Not only can you make a good living, but it's a fun business. Uh -huh. And it's exciting and it's always on the cutting edge and it's a, an important part of what goes on in the community. And in 1967, I became the president of the company and the general manager of KSTP TV. So I just built upon the things that he started. And we worked together until... Uh, he had a stroke in 1981. We were always very close and very uh, uh, cooperative. He, mm -hmm. you know, he told me what he thought, and I told him what I thought, but I knew who the boss was, and we got along just fine. So I don't want to say I did it. Uh, he did it, and I helped a little bit. How about that? Well, that's, that's true, I'm sure, but uh, now you've moved into still a third era, yeah. and that's uh, satellite communication. Yeah, he, and, uh, Tell us a little about what was involved in getting into this and the, and the risks that you took uh, getting into it. Well, we, we're still getting into it. Into the, the, the big project is the direct broadcast to home by satellite. And I, uh, as a broadcaster, was troubled by the possibility of that back in the 1960s when Hubert Humphrey talked about using C-band satellite, you may recall this, to broadcast to remote areas of Colorado and right. mountain states. And I was concerned about that because if that worked, I could, s could foresee and envision a situation, Jim, whereby the government would be forming a new broadcast system, bypassing local broadcasters and getting us ourselves into a situation such as it has been uh, in the rest of the world, such as the BBC and in France, where all the television until the 1980s was controlled by the government. <coughs> I take that back. In England, they're, they got private television before the 80s. But I could see that developing, and I talked to Hubert Humphrey at great length, wrote him letters, and said, this is a terrible thing. And, and Hubert Humphrey agreed to limit this program just to school districts and to bring educational-type programming on an experimental basis. And I can't tell you how that worked. But the seed was planted in my head that, that this direct broadcast satellite is something that should be private and not public, because I could understand uh, that this is going to be a, a great step forward when it happens. So. In 1981, when the FCC asked for licenses for direct broadcast satellite, our company was uh, the second company to file, ComSat having been the first. And we were the second, second company to have received a permit for a direct broadcast satellite license, which really, uh, Jim, is a nationwide broadcast license. And the name of that company? United States Satellite Broadcasting. Thank we you. have not broadcast anything yet. We're still uh, working on putting together all the different uh, parts of the puzzle which have to come together mm -hmm. and make it happen, the satellite and the different part participants in the consortium and all the rest. But I think that 
when this happens, and it's going to happen, it's going to very greatly have a great influence on uh, broadcasting, and, and it's going to change the whole business that we're all mm -hmm. uh, operating in. Now, that led us to a knowledge of satellites and what satellites could do. And one day, my son Stanley came in here with a man named Ray Conover and Paul Heinerscheid, and the three of them, uh, at Stanley's request, wanted to talk about uh, the thing they had in mind, which had now become SNG, Satellite News Gathering. And they told me that they thought that by using the direct broadcast satellite formula, which is very high power from a satellite to be received on a small dish, that they could reverse that equation and put very high power into a small dish on a truck, get up to a satellite, and then get back down to a bigger dish at a TV station. They, you can imagine how excited I became when they laid this whole idea out to me. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't my idea initially, it was their idea initially, and I said, let's go with it, and we we prevailed upon Telesat of Canada to, to uh, build a little truck for us, which they dubbed uh, the Ugly Duckling, and we did. The Ugly Duckling. And we... And we did some broadcasts, remote broadcasts of a couple of hockey games from South Dakota and, uh, and Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, when we were in Sioux City, Iowa, uh, and did the broadcast. I think it was it was sleeting there and raining here and snowing here. And when we did the broadcast from Des Moines of a hockey game on a Sunday afternoon of the St. Paul Vulcans, it was snowing here and it was raining, sleeting here later in the spring, and it was snowing in, uh, and it was raining in Iowa, in Des Moines. And we were told by all the experts that there's no way on KU band that you could go from a portable unit during a snowstorm. It worked. And in one of the broadcasts, one of the two tubes on the on the transmitter went out, and we only had half power, and it still, you didn't notice any difference at all. Hmm. So we did that experiment, we said, boy, we're really on to something. We called George Argera, who runs a company of ours in Florida, which is called Hubcom, and they manufacture ENG trucks and assemble them and do all sorts mm -hmm. of specialized equipment, tape delay equipment for uh, delaying broadcast programs uh, for up from two minutes up to five hours. And I said, George, we want you to come up here. We got him up and we told him we wanted to build a truck because we're going to start this business. We're going to call it CONUS, which means continental U.S. It's satellite or a military term. And, and we said, you have to have that truck ready. This was February, by April 15th for the NAB. And he had the thing built. Terrific. And we started the business and we bought a satellite transponder for uh, several million dollars from SBS, which was a big gamble. And we started the business. And now, Jim, I, I'm just pleased to say we've got great management under Chuck Dutcher and Anita Cleaver my son Stanley, and we've got uh, 69 television stations. We're about to have some more fall in. We've got uh, NHK in Japan, Fuji Sanke in Japan, Mitsubishi is a partner. We send uh, uh, daily feeds to the USIA, and our, our feeds are seen on 35 newscasts outside the United States. It all comes right from here in St. Paul, Minneapolis. Uh, we're also uh, working on other deals overseas, and we have a joint venture with the AP, as you probably know. So. Yes. That all was an offshoot of what we learned about satellites developing the DBS strategy. Mm -hmm. We learned that you can do certain things with KU satellites. And what, what makes us probably most proud is that we did it in spite of the fact that all three networks said it wouldn't work. And uh, we only could get a few brave seven of them broadcasters to go with us initially when we started. And uh -huh. we're just delighted as can be. And we've also now started a company called USTV, which uh, has two transponders on a satellite called K1 and 800 television stations take service. For example, last uh, week, was it last week the president spoke on Tuesday? Yes. Uh, when the networks wouldn't, didn't carry it, our, our uh, joint venture with AP TV Direct on our US TV satellite, K1, sent to all 800 TV stations in the United States free of charge the president's speech and the Democratic response. And the stations could use it or not use it as they saw fit. I can't tell how many used it, but we're, we're, uh -huh. we're fulfilling this service. Well, I you're right on the brink then. Yeah, I'm going to have to change tape. But the big project, the direct to home, is what we haven't mm -hmm. gotten off the ground. We have US TV is off the ground, and that's a, uh, we're doing, have you seen Great Weekend? Yes. Yeah. Did, you let, did you watch it this weekend? No, I didn't this weekend. Well, this I'm... weekend it hit a stride. You know, it's, uh, good. when you start developing a new show, it takes time, and uh -huh. the guy doing it, George Merlis, uh, did Good Morning America for years mm -hmm. at the start, and he said he thinks that by the w week two or three, he was where he was 20 weeks into, into uh, Good said, Morning right. America. So last weekend, great weekend, hit its stride. Uh, we hope to have clearance in New York and Chicago. 
in the next few weeks. We've got clearance in Los Angeles, cleared uh, 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 Atlanta on the CBS station last weekend, and the thing has got like 25 mm -hmm. stations now, and hopefully it'll be 100 and then 200. Do you originate all the program material <coughs> here? No, it originates. It's it originates from Los Angeles, and then we do the local news cut in, or the national news feed here using Stan Turner and the weather out of here, uh -huh. and Dr. Breen out of here. But we're probably going to move that around the country. I'm, I'm sorry, we don't do the uh, weather out here. The weather goes to a different location every week. I see. But this is all made possible by satellites. Mm -hmm. And satellites are, is changing the nature of our business. And satellites are not affected by atmospherics? No, very little. There is some effect, but not a great deal. For example, when the network, uh, ABC, sends their programming to us via C-band, uh, WCCO gets their programming uh, via C-band. But KARE, the NBC affiliate, gets theirs by KU-band. Now, CBS and ABC have chosen to stay on C-band because they are of the opinion that KU-band is affected by rain and snow and such. So what happens? Uh, on a typical thunderstorm morning in May, Channel 11, KRE, has a very clear, clean signal, although it's raining and mm -hmm. all the rest of it. Channel 4 and Channel 5 will be subject to, uh, uh, to uh, some atmospheric breakups because of the microwave link. Our microwave is out. I, I assume the CCOs is too, without Hugo or someplace. And so the microwave link in from the satellite is the weak link during thunderstorms. So I'd say that it's a toss-up. One's as good as the other in uh -huh. terms of, of uh, uh, quality transmission of the station. But in terms of convenience, KU band has it all over uh, C band because there's no federal permits required when mm -hmm. you want to do a broadcast. You mm -hmm. see, the, the secret to Conus is not only the small truck, it was the fact that you don't have to go to the FCC and get a permit. Because all the ground microwaves, Jim, and are, are on C band, uh -huh. You had to get a permit every time you wanted to do a C-band uplink so as to not interfere, and that would take 24 to 48 hours. Right. And with the KU band, you can drive into Jim Warman's backyard and in less than five minutes be a setup and broadcasting. Uh -huh. When he started, the network said it would take us 45 minutes to set up before we'd ever be able to broadcast. All the Kona stations can set up and be on the air within five minutes of the time they arrive at the site of a story. Is that right? Yeah, just boom, and they're operating. Gee, that's faster than radio. It's very fast. They uh -huh. just they just they stop the truck, they hit the switch, and the hydraulic feet go down, and they know where the satellite is, and they just turn the dish that way, and they're operating. And it's very very simple. Fantastic. Okay. But what, as I say, what makes it great is that everybody said it wouldn't work, and it mm. works wonderfully. <laughs> well, so we're pioneering, and we're trying our best, and uh -huh. you know, a lot of other people are doing exciting things. You know, we should be getting all this. We're not, are we? Yeah, we are. Oh, excuse me. But this is going to change the nature of broadcasting, uh -huh. and I'm afraid uh -huh. it's going to have uh, a very, very severe and devastating effect on local, broad local television broadcast stations. Well, I we wanted to have that same effect on the <coughs> network? Uh, and on the networks, too. You mm -hmm. see, the the general public doesn't have any interest or concern about where they get their programs from. Mm -hmm. and, the, and cable has proven that. You know, we all thought that people would be loyal to us. We've given this great service all these years, and, but people don't care. And cable has proven that. They'll watch where they can watch. And if people can buy a 24-inch dish or buy a little flat plate antenna, which I'll show you afterwards, and receive their programming, that's what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what effect that's going to have on the television stations in the Twin Cities or any other market in the United mm -hmm. States. I think it's not going to be a good effect. And that's why we have to make sure that we're there when it happens. Uh -huh. Well, Stanley, uh, when you've completed the pioneering on this, is the gate wide open then for anybody to do it? Well, there's a limited number of frequencies and licenses available for space, just as there are for terrestrial broadcasting. Oh. And uh, we now have a license for eight channels, and we requested six, uh, eight more, which would make 16. And we were there first, and it's, like, it's, it's just like when television began, Jim. In 1948, any American citizen could have had a television license permit for any station in the United States, any city in the United States, 1947 and 8, for the price of a postage stamp. But people didn't apply. Mm -hmm. When we applied for this license, 11, uh, 14 others applied. 11 or 14. A total of 11 or 14, two of whom were convicts in the federal penitentiary in Indiana. <laughs> so that left only, you know, a limited number of people. Mm -hmm. Nobody applied. People said, oh, this is crazy. So we applied and we have a license, so we intend to get that satellite launched and be in business. And Hughes is moving ahead with their project, and Hughes Aerospace, you know, is owned by General Electric. They're a very uh -huh. big company. So I would say that by 1991, between 1991 and 1993, you will have 
available in this country, high power direct broadcast satellites. It's working in Japan. Uh, it, today is uh, the, what, the 8th of February, 1988. Right. Uh, they begin their service in Japan having two channels of television and one channel of video text from the high power satellite. And between July 4th, when they begin service, 1987, and December 31st, 1987, they've sold 200 dishes, and they've got 450,000 people watching it, and they expect that by uh, uh, the uh, uh, one-year anniversary, July 4th, next year, they'll have over a million dishes. <coughs> and interestingly, the research indicates that the very first people who will buy a dish are people who subscribe to cable. Is that right? Yeah, so see, if the uninitiated will say, well, you know, I won't, who needs it because there's cable? The very first people that will buy a dish are the people who have cable because they're the people that want more and more and more. And is it better, better quality? Oh, it will be impossible to, to have a ghost on a DBS yes, transmission. Right. So it will be ghost free. It will be digital in many cases. So the picture will be a better picture than you've ever seen in your life. The, the audio will be compact disc uh, digital quality. And it will be the perfect medium for high definition television. Mm -hmm. And we can't stop it. If I if I drive home tonight and get killed in a snowstorm, a truck runs into me, DBS will go forward. If our company were to go out of business, DBS is going to happen. And uh, for broadcasters to, to ignore it is, in my judgment, a big mistake. See, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you why, why broadcasters are responding the way they are. And this is not an indictment. This is a, an objective analysis of what's happened in the business. You talked, Jim, at the outset of our conversation about my dear dad and others who were pioneers. And broadcasting was developed by dreamers, by pioneers, by uh, visionaries who had a great idea and they loved the business. And that's all they cared about. And they, as you did, you they worked and lived and ate and breathed broadcasting. And they built these radio stations and they built these TV stations. And almost all of those people are gone now. They've all sold out. And their stations are now run, and please, this is not an indictment, by people who come from business schools people who know how to maximize the bottom line, people who are marvelous managers. But these people, uh, through history, have not been the, the uh, dreamers or the pioneers or the entrepreneurs who have developed new things. So when this new thing called DBS comes along, the typical st station operator looks at it and says, well, you know, that's in the future, and I'm not really going to worry about it. I'm doing my thing. <laughs> and there are a few of us who still think of ourselves as not visionary but somewhat forward-looking and who have a dream and have a vision and who are willing to work just like the guys did in the old days of radio to make this happen. And that, I think that's the one, uh, well, probably the most important thing my dad gave me was this feeling of wanting to do things new. And before he had a stroke, he was very excited about the prospects of DBS. Oh, yeah, he, he was, was excited about uh -huh. it. And he encouraged me. He said, get that license, Stanley. And he said, I'm too old to really be a part of it. But he said, get that license and you know, get it for our company. And he said, you've got to do it in a way that uh, people won't be looking to Harvard Broadcasting to finance it because we haven't got that kind of money. But, and, but you know, you go ahead and you've got to do it. Entre entrepreneurs really have to have financing for their dreams. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, risk is involved in Great that. Great deal of risk is involved. Uh, did you? worry very long about that or did you simply go on your father's uh, suggestion that you well I didn't I didn't I'm not like kids Jim I'm not a worry I go to bed at night I go to sleep and you you know you're the problems and you and worrying about them doesn't make them go away and it doesn't help solve them mm -hmm. you know uh, thinking about it and trying to figure out how to solve the problem is the way you go about it so uh, I'm not worried about it nor was I worried about it it's going to happen and hopefully we'll be among the first to make it happen and if we aren't you know we are but I think we're going to be <laughs> you know, working darn hard at it. Well, good luck on it, Sammy. Oh, thank you, Jim. And I, I say it's a pleasure to have a chance to talk to a man who's been so much inside well, of what's happening in broadcasting in this age. Well, I want to say that when I was a young man in this business, Jim Borman was a big name at that time, and I had great <laughs> respect for you, Jim, because well, you've you. been a terrific leader in broadcast news. Thank you, Broadcast Sammy. journalism <laughs> over the years. We've competed, but we're always gentlemen. And exactly. I have great respect for each That's other. That's right. Thank you. Thank you.